I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. The Bible refers to the word heaven about 550 times. The Hebrew words in the Old Testament and the Greek words in the New Testament both mean what is lofty or what is high up. Heaven is simply a name for something very high. In 2 Corinthians 12 verses 2, Paul says he was caught up into the third heaven. Simply put, there is the atmospheric heaven. This is where we live. This is the environment, the atmosphere of air around the earth containing the air we breathe. It also includes the heaven of clouds, rain and wind. Above our atmospheric heaven, there is the planetary heaven, containing all the stars, the planets, the sun and the moon, and all the celestial bodies, where there is an infinite amount of space. Thirdly, there is the heaven where Paul was caught up, the third heaven. This is the home of God, the divine heaven where God dwells. While we understand that there is no place that can contain God, Scripture makes that very clear, because He is too great, too glorious, and too infinite. But even though heaven, as it were, cannot contain him, it is his throne. Paul was saying that he was caught up beyond the atmosphere, beyond the planetary space, into the very abode of God. Paul, when he was caught up into the third heaven, was not even allowed to talk about what he saw. However, when you come to the New Testament, the best description of heaven comes right here in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 as John goes up to the third heaven and is told by God to write down what he saw. This is the record of what John saw and heard when he was taken into heaven. Keep in the back of your mind that Revelation is firstly a book of symbols. Secondly, it is a book written from the viewpoint of God himself. And thirdly, everything in Revelation is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Revelation in this respect summarizes and concludes God's complete revelation and dealings with mankind. In the last podcast, episode 28, I introduced you in the first four verses of Revelation chapter 4 to what John saw when he was caught up into the third heaven. He saw a great throne and someone sitting on it, and we learn that the person who John saw on the throne was God in his fullness, God the Father. God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, as represented by the three colors of jasper, carnelian, and emerald. Now we read further in Revelation 4, verses 5 and 6, the following. From the throne came flashes of lightning, and rumblings, and peals of thunder, and before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. These are all symbols. What they really represent does not always appear like this. These are pictures, a manifestation of what actually is there. So what is manifesting itself? Flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. These are the sights and sounds associated with the giving of the law on Mount Sinai in the Old Testament, where the mountain was shaken constantly with great rumblings and thunders. The mountain was covered by dark clouds lit by lightning flashes, it was so awesome a sight that the people of Israel were stunned with fear. These sounds are a symbol, therefore, of the judgments of God. What we have to understand about the book of Revelation is that this book describes a time when God deals with mankind in a new way. At the end of human history, God at last turns from grace into judgment. We see God in his role as sovereign judge over all people. The symbols here of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder are repeated several times through the book of Revelation. They are a reference point to which the book returns again and again. In Revelation 8 verses 5, Revelation 11 verses 19, and Revelation 16 verses 18. Each time they appear, an additional element of judgment is added. The other symbols in Revelation 4 verses 5 to 6 are symbols of the Spirit of God, who is the instrument of God's judgment. John saw seven burning lamps blazed with John saw seven burning lamps blazing with divine vengeance. That is the Spirit of God. John saw a great sea of crystal before the throne. Crystal speaks of the purity and the holiness of God. The sea is the Spirit of God in his purity and holiness. 
That is why we call him the Holy Spirit. It is that holiness which he must impart to anyone who dares to stand in the presence of God. That is what Hebrews 12 verses 14 tells us. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one can see the Lord. This is the spirit of holiness that stands before the throne of God like a brilliant crystal pool, mirroring the holy purity of God. In Revelation 4 verses 6 to 8 we are introduced to the first set of strange symbolic creatures. Around the throne were four living creatures who were full of eyes in front and behind, seeing everything and knowing everything that is around them. The first living creature was like a lion, the second creature like an ox, the third creature had the face of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes all over and within and underneath their wings, and day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Ruler of all, who was and who is and who is to come, the unchanging eternal God. These are winged animals, covered with eyes all over their bodies, even under their wings, we are told. But however mysterious they are, they are not new or unique to Revelation. Ezekiel 1 verses 4 to 11 describes the same creatures, and Ezekiel calls them cherubim. These beings are the guardian spirits of God. Isaiah 6 calls them seraphim, translated as burning ones. Ezekiel's vision also mentions the faces here, the lion, the ox, the man and the eagle. John sees the same thing. Most theologians agree that the number four, or multiples thereof, symbolize the earth, creation and judgment. Like the four points of the compass, the four corners of the earth, and twelve, which is three times four, divine government. These creatures, therefore, are associated with God's government of the created universe. We are very ignorant people when it comes to natural phenomena. Look how we have destroyed and ravaged the earth with our selfish and wicked activities. But here are creatures who understand and help God rule the natural world. The eyes of the creatures symbolize discernment and knowledge. The wings describe speed and motion. A lion symbolizes power. An ox symbolizes patience and strength, a man intelligence and wisdom, and an eagle of swiftness. These living creatures are the ones who will summon the four horsemen in chapter 6. They are the ones who command these riders to come and call them into activity. They also lead creation to worship its creator. Did you know that nature can worship? Nature worships when anything in it fulfills the intention and design that God had for it. One of the tasks of these four living creatures is to ensure that the whole creation fulfills the perfection God intended for it. This is why they are praising God all the time. All of nature should lead us to worship God in the same way. But do we? What does Revelation 4 verses 9 to 11 say? And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. These four living creatures are the embodiment of worship that comes from an understanding and appreciation of God's creation. However, we are thankless and unappreciative creatures. Think about the creation for a moment. God worked without tools to create the universe. He worked without elements or materials, and He worked without help. Psalm 33 verses 9 says, For He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. God controls everything in His creation at all times, and no one can assist Him, and no one can stop Him. He is sovereign in everything and absolutely competent and absolutely powerful to control it all. The right response of any vision of God should be to fall before Him, sensing our sin and our unworthiness, overwhelmed with a holy fear and a heart of gratitude for His mercy to us as sinners. But do we? 
In episode 27 of the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, when we studied the letter to the church at Laodicea, I asked the question, as Christians living in the lukewarm Laodicean age, are we, in the here and now, truly a worshipping people as God intended us to be? We come now to Revelation chapter 5 verses 1 to 4 that introduces the seven-sealed scroll. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Some of the questions that we might ask regarding this passage are, what does this scroll represent? Why is the scroll sealed? Why is it written on both sides? Who can open it? What is required to open the scroll? It is not a book, but a scroll, which is rolled up parchment or paper with seven seals on the end, so that as the seals are broken, the scroll is unrolled and the writings on it are revealed and can be read. Later, in Revelation chapter 6, the opening of the seals and the unrolling of the scroll will reveal pivotal events that will occur on the earth. The unrolling of the scroll is covered from Revelation chapter 6 to chapter 10, when the sounding of the seven trumpets announced the opening for the seventh seal. What does the scroll represent? In chapter 10, verses 7, a clue is given to us as to what the scroll signifies. In the days of the trumpet called to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. This scroll is a mystery book. It answers questions that man has always asked but which no one is able to answer. Why can't we solve the great problems of mankind? This scroll answers the question of how God will bring about his promise of a golden age when men will live in a world without war, bloodshed, hatred and prejudice, and with no sorrow, tears or death. This scroll was written both on the front and the back. In biblical times, scrolls were seldom written on both sides because one side was usually rough and uneven. Normally one side was smooth for writing. When both sides of a scroll were written on, it was an indication of a full and important message, and it was written on both sides to indicate that there was no way to change it. God has written it, and there's no possibility that anyone can change it. In John 19 verses 22, Pilate said about the sign that he had placed above the cross of Jesus that what is written is written. Nothing can change it. In Revelation 5 verses 2, John hears an invitation to the entire universe proclaimed by a mighty angel that if anyone can open the scroll, let him step forward. Who is worthy to open the scroll is the question. This is the question that is asked in politics. In every election year, it is what we are asking, who is worthy? Who among us is capable of leading us and providing the solutions to the problems that have been here for centuries? Who is smart enough? Who is moral enough? Who is worthy? The Greek word for worthy is axion. It describes the known nobility and suitability of a person to accomplish a task. If we look at great world leaders throughout history like Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler and Nelson Mandela, none of these men were able to bring peace to the world. Politicians promise that they are able, but they are not worthy, because they cannot fulfill their promises. So this is why John wept. The Amplified Bible says that he wept audibly and bitterly, which tells us that he was heartbroken and very upset because no one could unseal the scroll or even look inside. No one knew how to go about it. No one had a clue as to how to solve the issues that plague mankind. John then learns that the problem is already solved in Revelation 5 verses 5. The 24 elders around the throne of God know the answer. One of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Root of David are both Jewish titles. Both refer to prophecies from the Old Testament. That is Genesis 49 verses 9 to 10 and Isaiah 11 verses 10. Both predict that there would be one from the tribe of Judah and from the family of David 
who would at last rule over the earth and solve its problems. However, when John turns to see the conquering Lion of Judah, what does he see in verse 6? Between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. John expected to see a lion, but what he saw was a lamb, with the marks of death still upon him. In these two symbols, the lion of Judah and the lamb that was slain, John sees the joining of two themes that run throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Lions have always been the symbol of majesty, power, rule and authority. However, lambs submit and lambs die. Here is the one who conquers by submitting. The history of earth has now been shown and the key to that history is the nation Israel. There is no blessing for earth until Israel is blessed. The Apostle Paul declares that in Romans 11 verses 15 when he says, For if Israel's present rejection of salvation is for the reconciliation of the world to God, what will their acceptance of salvation be but nothing less than life from the dead? The time has now come for the restoration of Israel, as the prophets predicted. As the Lion of Judah, Jesus will rule the world with a rod of iron. Psalm 2 verses 1 to 3 and verse 6 says that, If anyone is weak and faltering, helpless or hopeless, this lion will also be a lamb. As the Lamb of God, he is filled with mercy and grace, but if any should begin to live a rebellious or defiant life, the lamb will become a lion. According to John's vision, this lamb had seven horns. Horns in scripture symbolize power, and seven is a number of completeness. So, the lamb has completeness of power. Hebrews 7 verses 25 says that, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. And Matthew 28 verses 18 declares that, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. The seven eyes of the Lamb speak of full intelligence and discernment by means of the Holy Spirit. These seven eyes are the seven spirits of God, which, as we have already seen in chapter 1, is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. John 2 verses 25 tells us that, But Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus, therefore, is the only one worthy to take the scroll and to remove the seals, and to disclose and execute God's plan for the final stages of human history. Jesus came and he won. He defeated death. He defeated Satan. He defeated demons. He defeated sin. He defeated hell. Jesus the Lamb is worthy because the Lamb is the Lion, and the Lion is the King of Kings. It is his death as a lamb that now qualifies him to be a lion and a monarch. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 29.